Yay! Hey, everybody. Welcome to our first episode of Newbie Star Trek. Uh, I'm Marvin, and I'm joined here by my friends Dan and Ricardo. Say hi, everybody. Hey, Hello. I'm Dan. Hi. So I guess we should explain the premise of the podcast. Uh, the whole point of the podcast is that Star Trek is a fun show. Uh, we're starting with Star Trek The Next Generation, by the way. And TNG is a fun show, um, but we're not like huge hardcore fans of it. I think I'm probably the closest to being a hardcore fan of TNG, but my exposure- You've certainly seen the most. Yeah, I've seen the whole series at least once, and I like- And you've actually watched shows beyond TNG as well. Yeah, yeah. So I've seen, you know, a little bit of TOS, not that much. Uh, I've seen a lot of DS9, I think almost all of it. Um, I've seen a lot of Voyager, enough to know that I didn't care that much for it. Um, and I saw a little bit of Enterprise, and I've seen almost nothing of the new ones. Um, what about you, Dan? Uh, I am at the level where I might be able to name all those shows if I think really hard. <laughs> um, I've seen about three, well, no, 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 two and a half seasons of TNG, because I started watching it on Netflix like a few years ago and just stopped and started intermittently. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, other than that, I've seen uh, only the movies uh, Star Trek II. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, uh, the older movies. Right? Yeah, the Rathacon. The Rath yeah. Uh, the Journey Home, Star Trek IV, and uh, all of the J.J. Abrams um, <laughs> universe uh, Star Trek movies. Right, right. What about you, Ricardo? I, You know what it sounded like when you were describing the shows you'd watch? It sounded like you were describing cleaning products. I've watched 409, WD40. Uh, I haven't seen anything. I haven't seen anything. Right. Uh, well, well, of the shows, I, I've seen, um, of course, The Wrath of Khan, and I've seen the J.J. Abrams movies. And then I did do like a run through of all the like original movies with like Shatner and then the movies with Picard. Gotcha. Um, but I was way too high to remember anything. <laughs> See, that's Fair why enough. I was kind of excited. To... Yeah. See, Dan and I were talking about this podcast for a long time where we kind of go through every episode one by one uh, and kind of just mm -hmm. talk about it. But I think what we were missing was Ricardo because Ricardo is the is the person who is interested in the show, has looked at it from a distance for a while. And, and knows nothing. But you've never like watched it. Yeah, like yeah. Ac actually nothing. Like I feel underinformed. Um, I'm like I'm in a weird purgatory of Star Trek knowledge because I've absorbed like a reasonable amount given my exposure, but I have no like expertise. Right. So mm -hmm. like R R Ricardo, on the other hand, has had has seen no episodes. Yeah, yeah. I, I not even like oh check this episode out nothing nothing no not one in fact this is where I I discussed before we started that I had a confession to make and I'll make it now <laughs> I started watching it because our plan was you said hey watch the first episode it's a two parter yeah start watching it and I I launched my player I, I'm watching them on Netflix yeah because uh, they're all up there and I I hit play so I I just search Star Trek the Next Generation I hit play and I started watching it i i didn't i didn't look at the screen for like a split second and then i and then and then the episode started and i and i, and I was watching mm -hmm. and i was like oh this is a weird place to start okay this is interesting <laughs> all right and i was really into the episode and, and i was like oh this is cool i don't know anybody's names or anything i mean I, okay this guy's this person okay and then it goes to the next episode after i finished that one uh -huh. and i'm like oh i guess it is a split in two pieces marvin told me it was in, on Netflix, it was they combined them to one, and I was like, oh, "That was short for a two-parter." And then I realized I was watching episode twelve. <laughs> Someone had watched Star Trek on my Netflix <laughs> up to eleven, and so I started at twelve, which oh, is the no, data lore. Yeah, you got a head start. Oh, oh yeah. okay. So, oh, great. but here's the thing: that's why that's that explains my relationship with Star Trek. That I didn't know. I didn't know that I didn't know anything. So I thought oh, <laughs> this is a very interesting place to start. But okay, I'm going to go with it. And I, uh, I'll tell you what. That would have been a good episode to start with. <laughs> well, did you end up going back to the the first? Yeah, episode? yeah, yeah. Then, okay, then I went. Okay. Then I went back and watched it, and then right. I was like, oh, okay, now, now this makes a lot of sense. Now that <laughs> it's that still a weird start to a series, right? 
Yes, very weird, very weird. Yeah, so so the episode is Encounter at Farpoint, and then this was the two-parter, two-hour special that started off the whole Next Generation series. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's kind of a weird one, because it's not like a two-parter where it's one coherent story. It's a two-parter where they mixed two episodes together and pretended they're one story. And they're really not. It's like instead of an A plot and a B plot, you have two A plots. And with the very like fleeting connective tissue. Yeah. Like they're connected, but um technically. <laughs> yeah, it, it 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 it's fairly touch and go with that. Yeah. Well, before before we get started, uh the original air date for the the first two parter episode encounter at Farpoint, that was of September twenty eighth of nineteen eighty seven. This is technically an eighty show, which is Kind of weird to Dan and I, because I think we both probably have memories of catching the show randomly on TBS and always considered it like a 90s show. <laughs> so, well, th- th- here's the thing. Like, this is why you're the bigger fan than I am. You actually watched it. I would see it and just skip right past because we're only cartoons. <laughs> That's true. When I was at a certain age, I was like, fuck this. Where Where is my Fresh Prince of Bel-Air? <laughs> yeah, and I never grew out of it, so... Well, I guess I kind of did. I'm on this podcast. <laughs> yeah, now you're, now you're on a Star Trek podcast. So. Uh, anyway, yeah, notab- notably, it premiered before either of us were born. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, okay, Dan, how about you uh, uh, take it away and uh, give us some some uh, temporal context for what was happening around this time. Set phasers to 1987. <laughs> That doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't. No. Uh, <laughs> so uh, Ronald Reagan was in the second term uh, on the Billboard charts. Uh, a notable okay, it, La Bamba by Los Lobos is actually a oh. cover of the Richie Valens original, but that the Los Lobos cover became popular because the movie La Bamba had been released in the summer, like the summer that just passed, and. Mm-hmm. Um, it was charting pretty high and like the movie blew it up. And so it was the summer of La Bamba, oddly enough. P- the Princess Bride had premiered in theaters just three days prior. And both Castlevania II, Simon's Quest, and the original first Legend of Zelda had released on the NES just the previous month. Oh, did they actually come out that close together? I never realized that. Yep, same month. And other sci-fi movies that came out that year were, just for like context, were The Predator. My favorite movie of all time. <laughs> sure. Um, Masters of the Universe, which I'm going to count as sci fi. Sure. Space and Robocop were all the same year, 1987. Damn. Yeah, it was a magical year. And Spaceballs, uh, no. I think. Yeah, Spaceballs. Oh, Spaceballs. Too. Okay. Yeah. So more all the things, all the things plus TNG. So that's an interesting era of, of, of media for this. Ricardo, having seen Encounter at Farpoint, um, could you give us a plot breakdown of what goes on. Oh, is that, was that my job? But I'm going to give you like the guy who doesn't know anybody's name. All right. So like, all right, yeah, uh, this, is why, this is why I want yeah. you to, I want you to, to, um, to, to so break it down. I'm going to break it down also by like, like the, the narrative threads I was following and mm-hmm. which are going to be all over the place. They're not going to follow the episode. They're going to f- be following like the <laughs> emotional thread I was following. Um, Great. You, you don't have the full crew. Um, no, because yeah. I know this because uh, I had seen, like, like I said, I saw episode 12 ahead of this one. <laughs> uh, so I know that certain people weren't there. Like uh, commander William Riker isn't there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's this other dude I, that I don't know if he's in the other episodes or not. Um, he's a, uh, Irish actor, uh, yeah, I, Miles I, O'Brien. Yeah. Yes, yes. I don't know if he comes back or not, but like he wasn't. He was there. He was like in the is the bridge. Is that what you call it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he, he it's weird. So Miles O'Brien is like the redheaded stepchild of the Star Trek universe because like he's kind of important. Like he shows up in this show constantly. I've come to really enjoy him just completely tangentially. Yeah, like, he's, I, I I barely know his deal, but I love Miles O'Brien. It's because like they yeah. they saddle him with like really like d- like basically in in this episode, his job is to man I think the like the con station. I'm not yeah, quite yeah. sure what that means, but <laughs> yeah, um, the, the con well, on the battle bridge. Yeah, but then well, but after the, a while, like because because he's there, and then eventually, um, Jordy shows up and he takes over his spot, and then you no, never saw him again. 
Well, they both work in the back. They're both okay, like okay. engineering guys. So Miles actually usually works the teleporter room. Oh, okay, and then okay. there's like this ongoing joke that he's just sitting there in the teleporter room, not doing anything. Oh, the transporter. Yeah, see. <laughs> uh, hey, hey, someone's going to yell at you, dude. <laughs> God damn he's, it, in dude. The, he's in the transport room, kind of <laughs> just sitting there waiting for orders and no one will actually like do anything because he's just waiting. But then he ends up going like this. There are some episodes of Star of TNG where like he's actually a very important character and he's actually pretty awesome. And then mm -hmm. he ends up actually being one of the two characters that transfers over from TNG to DS9, Deep Space Nine, which hmm. is really odd. And I don't know if it's because he's affordable or if it's because they thought he'd be interesting. Uh, but either way, that's how they have the connective tissue. Him and Worf eventually move over to DS9. He has uh, this compelling, like, put upon every man energy. Yeah, I think that's what makes him, like, kind of fun. Is that he's just like, he's he. that's why he's Irish. He's just a working class guy. Like, there's one episode where he'll be like, you know, we're not like the rest of these guys. We didn't enlist in Starfleet. We're just like, because he didn't, like, enlist as an officer. He's basically you can tell he engine. checks the clock every so often for when his shift's over, and then he goes to the bar. Yeah, exactly. He goes to ten four to get grab a drink. I, and you know. no spoilers, dude. I don't know what this what this speak of is, guys. What is this <laughs> bar you speak of? <laughs> oh, you'll, I'm just we'll saying get to a general four. bar. Okay, Irish okay. people. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> people. Um. So you have this this doctor uh, Crusher, right? And mm -hmm, they're they're mm -hmm. picking her up, and they're picking up uh Riker and the wesley crusher in like this weird island that like is futuristic but it also has like ruins next to it it's very weird <laughs> yeah it's very um weird. and then at it. one point like they get kidnapped by this like hologram like it's weird they get they don't even get kidnapped like they're they're on the bridge and then they like blink and they're in this like weird like <laughs> like futuristic but old like they're being judged by this guy and yeah, it's yeah. very weird. <laughs> uh, but the storyline that really got me was the whole, like as soon as Patrick Stewart, Luke Picard, John Luke Picard yeah. sees uh, Dr. Crusher, like there's some weird tension and mm -hmm. I don't know what's to come. I don't, I have, cause I haven't seen the episode. So, but what I'm like the, the, the emotional vibe I got was, Oh, Hey, uh, remember your husband was dying and then I fucked you. And then we had a kid. <laughs> <laughs> and I think this is a kid, but I'm not sure. But yeah, I fucked my best friend's wife. Like that's the vibe that I was. That getting. is the vibe, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah it feels <laughs> very much like that. Yeah. Is is is? Uh, do, do, so no, I, I don't want to know. Oh, I, I can't know. tell you what really okay, happened. Okay, 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 okay. So. And I um, don't even know if that's how it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's the vibe I got, and that was to me that was the most interesting part, and also like that that John Lee Picard is like asking uh, Riker like um, questions about like because. I it seems like he had gotten the job ready, but he's know, like, he's like he's still interviewing. Yeah. But he's so mean to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, he's like, the one thing I ask of you is that you make sure that I, like, is, like he wants to look good in front of kids. He wants to look like a family guy. And I'm like, that's a weird thing to be like, hey, dude, I know you're my second in command, but like, dude, you, you gotta watch out because I I don't know how to act around kids. It's like, dude, do you punch? That's kids? a very weird thing. Yeah, to ask. yeah. you need to be my kid wingman. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Will. on it's your like, first day on the job. Maybe Make sure I don't fuck up these kids, you know. Yeah. But how? Like, uh, my question would have been like, but how? Like, are you, do you see kids and you automatically want to punch them in the face? Like, how? No, What's he has problem, to keep around a supply of sunglasses at all times to, yeah. to like, you know, hip him up. Yeah. And it's such a it's such a weird Picard. Like, you haven't seen the rest of the series, but like, yeah. this Picard, like the first episode Picard, is such a strangely angry man. Like, he's constantly yeah. like yelling at people. Yeah, he's like yeah. when Riker first comes aboard the the battle bridge, he doesn't even look at him, you know. No, he's, no. Like, just, he's like busy poking some buttons, and he goes, yeah. "All right, he's here. Uh, bring him up to speed on this, you know, basically a clip show from the last episode, and I'll go into my ready room and wait for him." It's like what he, he's your second in command. He just it's his first day on the job. You're just gonna be like, ah, whatever, you know? It doesn't yeah, make any like sense. it strikes me as like the the writers like not quite knowing where what kind of captain they want picard to be that's and very it, much it, 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 yeah. it also feels like they weren't like patrick stewart 
wasn't part of the picture when they were writing it either. Yeah, I think like they're trying to compensate a bit. I think when they, I mean, it's pretty much well known at this point that when they first were making the show, they were really afraid that they didn't have a Captain Kirk, right? Mm -hmm. They had a Picard and Kirk got by entirely from being like, I'm this suave, all American guy who is also a great captain. Mm -hmm. And that's broadly true. But Picard, I think they wanted to write a captain who's like, He's, he's already like this old fart, right? And they wanted him to be very diplomatic and not action oriented, which is like the opposite of what you kind of want as your leading person for a show. So I think they were very worried. So they, I think they tried to make his personality more domineering than it needed to be. And even then they were still worried. So then they throw in Commander Riker and just be like, you're our Kirk. In the event that Picard doesn't work out, you'll replace him. Um, yeah, Riker was definitely <laughs> like the the closest to a Kirk analog. Yeah, yeah, because he's he's like he's hitting on people in like the first fifteen minutes of his appearance, <laughs> like, and and there's yeah. that one like ensign that totally checks out his butt. I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it, and it's funny because like he he meets the doctor and and like Wesley is like yeah dude like like it, automatically yeah. he's like he's like dude she's fucking single dude my dad's dead dude. <laughs> <laughs> he's trying to like like get her to date or something it's really weird yeah, yeah. and then wesley is kind of like like he's like a know-it-all and he's like he's on the bridge and he's like naming all these buttons and then looks like annoying looks, looks like fuck you get the fuck out of here dude you know too much <laughs> yeah, like how the hell do you know about this ship yeah yeah, yeah. get out he's um, so angry at him i mean justifiably so but it's still funny how angry he is okay so yeah, like yeah. It, like will wheaton's like turn as wesley is like infamous and it's kind of looped all the way back around to everyone kind of likes Will Wheaton now. But like Wesley in that first episode, like strikes me as we w actually wanted like a 10 year old, but we got a yeah. 14 year old. Yeah. It's like almost like you wanted someone very young. And then yeah. they, like they his level, up. his like his level of like precociousness combined with like his awkward, like, Hey, uh, don't worry about my mom. She's just, uh, I'm just going to spill all the guts and the family secrets. And like, that's something like yeah. a little kid does. Yeah. And like, what, like Will Wheaton at that age seemed a little too old for that. Yeah. yeah. Cause it, cause, cause he, he's not at the age where it's like, oh, it's charming that this really young kid knows. It's more yeah, like, it's more like, like what the fucking fuck annoying. Get you? the fuck out of here. <laughs> like, they, they're old they enough needed... to know the rules of how a star bridge works. Yeah, they needed the like like like, um, like like Haley Joel Osmond in like the Sixth Sense. Like yeah, you want someone that age. That's yeah. that smart. Yeah. Um. But yeah, so like you have that storyline, then you have the storyline where like this like mushroom is after them, and like <laughs> like the squid, this like sea squid is. Well, like, you don't know they're squids. Yet. You don't know, yeah. but yeah, yeah. you think well, it's a spaceship. Look, I think they look the most like jellyfish. Yeah, I guess so. I guess. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Jellyfish. Yeah, and, with like shoelaces then, on the bottom. Yeah, <laughs> but then you have this dude yeah. who, who like keeps showing up, and he's like, "You guys are, you humans are fucking shitheads." Yes. And it's like, dude, is that like, no, that's not, that's not us, dude. That was like the Nazis, bro. And he's like, "No, dude, <laughs> yeah. all you." And he, to me, like the tone, not his, not what he's actually saying, but like the inner monologue is of a drunk guy. Like, <laughs> fuck you, you guys are dicks, man. No, dude, no, no. That 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 was like that was enough. That was like that was my grandfather. He was a dick. No, fuck you. You're still yeah. a dick, dude. It's in you, dude. <laughs> it's great because it's like <laughs> like Q. So it's funny. Q is such a such a prolific Star Trek character in general. But this is the first episode where he's introduced. And later on, you'll see like he's a lot more like playful and like kind of a fun character. But here yeah, he's, he's like way more of like a trickster later on. Yeah, yeah. But now okay. he's like, I will fucking murder you and your entire yeah. speech. <laughs> he's Neil Breening it up right now because he's yeah. like, you're not yeah. worth it. So this is uh, here's a clip of the one you first enters. Right. Thou art notified that thy kind have infiltrated the galaxy too far already. Thou art directed to return to thine own solar system immediately. Quite a directive. Would you mind identifying what you are? We call ourselves the Cube. Well, thou mates call me that. It's all much the same thing. And the only reason he was talking that way is because he was like assuming the affectations of like a like 19th cent or 18th century like sea captain. Yeah. yeah Later yeah. on, he becomes uh, basically Patton. 
from yeah yeah, yeah. and the, and he, but he mentions like full metal like stuff from like full metal jacket and stuff as quotes well he he some... like explicitly calls out the commies yeah, um, yeah. like with with, a, with an accent yeah. You know, yeah just to hammer it home yeah and then and then they have that completely okay this court case scene it strikes me as we didn't have a set so we borrowed yeah. set and clothing from a different show yeah and we shoved it in here because it's like <laughs> they're, they're they're all dressed completely randomly like yeah. uh you look at the crowd it's like it's a multiracial crowd but they're all dressed like they're from like like old russia or something and then one of them is holding like a broken umbrella for some reason i don't know what that's supposed to be is it supposed to be a broken umbrella or is it supposed to be some sort of like antenna device I it only know. reads as a broken umbrella to me but now that you have mentioned this room, we must address the elephant within, which is <laughs> Mr. Kerry Hiroyuki Tagawa, who yeah. is, uh, you know, with a full Shang Tsung mustache and everything. Yeah. Yeah. He is he is credited in the in the credits as Mandarin Bailiff. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Yeah. Not yeah. That. It's weird. He has it's a, it's a stereotypically Chinese guy. Yeah, and they're and they're running the courtroom, and then uh, Q comes in as the judge on this thing, and he we're supposed to. This is the future. <laughs> well, yeah. it was it was a mo it was like a recreation of like twenty seventy something, was it not? Yeah, yeah it's, it's yeah, a recreation it was, it was of like, like the post World War Three or something. Yeah, because yeah. humanity goes through a third world war, and this is yeah, what it's the, like a post apocalyptic the, Mad Max like Thunderdome trial. Yeah. Um, that he like invents for them. Yeah. Um, when the military is a bunch of guys in a bunch of like uh, microwavable padding <laughs> gear and they all take drugs all the time from a little pouch yeah. on their chest. Yeah. It's, so a, it's like Mad Max good style. as they die. Yeah. It's like right before the guy who's like shooting the gun constantly in yeah, the air I to mean, get everyone to it, shut up. It's a surprising <laughs> amount of world building packed into yeah. a, in a tiny little scene. Yeah. It's like right. Bef it's like Mad Max. It's like right before he dies, he takes a sip of the drug so yeah, he can yeah. feel good before it gets shot. It's, yeah, uh, it's, it's like, very it's like he was scene. spraying his, his mouth with chrome. And then the weird part before that, like even before this court scene, like the whole part where, okay, Q confronts them, right? And he's like, you, he gives him an ultimatum. And then Picard does this weird maneuver. And, and the only reason I can think of why they do this is so that they can have a cool action scene for some reason. Right. Is like he, it's a he, tense like bridge command like uh, scenario, I guess. Yeah. It's like they go to like warp 9.5 and yeah, it's like, oh, my the God. The limits of the of the turbines. Uh, they do an emergency saucer like detachment at warp nine point whatever which is supposed yeah. to be like a really dangerous thing but it happens yeah. fine yeah fine. data is like we have there's no room for error it just happens <laughs> fairly undramatically but do, why do, do you do, do you that in the that? first place do you see that later on like do you see that like the saucer separating anything else I, saucer episode? separation happens at least in the movies again um, oh, okay, but, okay. but I think in the show, okay. So I think in the show they were just trying to show it off. Like, here's all the here's the cool like thing we made, you know? Yeah, and, and that that is legitimately like a, a neat new thing for the Enterprise to do. Yeah, like, and it is pretty. I mean, it sort of also helps explain why the Enterprise is shaped that way. Because originally yeah, yeah, it was true. it was just like here's a flying saucer, but that's too stereotypical. So let's add two jet propulsion engines to it, right? Mm -hmm. And that was basically the original design of the Enterprise. So now they're trying to be like, okay, there's a reason for that. It's because the saucer is like the civilian-ish area. And then the rest of it is like the more military area where only like um, high level personnel really hang out. So that's, that's fine. It's just, it makes me like, why did he have this like fast and furious style chase away from him in the first place? Yeah. Only to separate. It actually really falls apart under scrutiny because Q just told them, hey, turn away and go home and then he's like guys we're gonna turn away and go home as fast as we fucking can <laughs> <laughs> and then q chases him yeah well why and would then you they chase him and then they separate only to reconnect later for no well, reason and and like <laughs> and like give give like Riker a weird test like hey you know yeah. this thing <laughs> that like we do automatically nah fucking do it manually dude 
<laughs> he gives no reason why. It's yeah, not no. like something's wrong with the computer or yeah. like it's like just it's, hey, it's old, new guy, we're gonna haze you by making you do this very difficult. Yeah, yeah and Riker the, doesn't even do it. He fucking forces Miles O'Brien to take control. It's, and that's Miles, the thing, <laughs> that's the thing that I, that I didn't get is like I, I expected like oh this is gonna be cool like like some like manual. He grabs like a gonna, joystick. Yeah, 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 like yeah, some, yeah. It's gonna pop out of like the ground. Like like it's gonna be You're gonna really put on cool. like a power glove. Yeah, yeah. and no, the, he all he did was like. 32 degrees east oh, rotate <laughs> he just stands like, oh. behind miles while miles does all the work <laughs> well I, i'm a, like okay like obviously from a writing perspective it's supposed to come off as impressive like this <laughs> yeah. is this is just a, a a huge contrivance to give Riker like a moment of competence right, um, right. and so he's able to call out with precision every single direct to it, every single direction uh like i i see what they were going for but it does come off as like Okay, great. Now you do it. <laughs> uh, so that's a weird setup. And then that's when we get to the weird, like, Groppler Zorn stuff. Okay, first of all, this guy's name is Groppler Zorn. That's the guy who runs this whole co- this whole yeah, he's, country. He's the guy with, like, the... <laughs> the and he has some of the worst hair I've ever seen on a big, on a yeah, big actor. Yeah. <laughs> So this is this is what this is Riker's entrance, and also the first time he meets, uh, we see this Groppler Zorn character. Groppler, I could have sworn this wasn't here a minute ago. And did your failure to notice it make it unwelcome? Not at all, Groppler. I trust it will be the same with Farpoint Station Commander. A few easily answered questions about it won't make Starfleet appreciate it less. And it's delicious. Thank you. Good morning, Grappler Zorn. Good morning. You have been told not to do that. Why can't you understand? It will arouse their suspicion. And if that happens, we will have to punish you. We will, I promise you. What an asshole. (laughs) I know it's this weird scene where it's like, okay, so the entire negotiation for for this entire planetary like star base thing, just with this one dude, and mm-hmm. then uh, he basically the the planet makes apples magically for Riker because Riker wanted apples, yes. and then when Riker leaves, Gropper Zorn yells at the planet because it's he's angry because he made apples for Riker. <laughs> Yeah, it, it is kind of awkward and clunky the way it happens, but I will admit that the first time I saw like this like setup where this stuff appears out of nowhere because Riker just happened to say he wanted it, and then like it's clear that there's like a, a, a like a third party, some invisible entity in play. Like I was intrigued. I was like, okay, what's going on here? Who is this? Right. Who, who is this thing? What is the nature of this yeah. thing? Right. He's just calling it names. He's like, fuck you, dude. You make more buildings. <laughs> you're, you're, you're fat. Yeah. <laughs> Don't make just, apples in front of people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you bear yourself in front of those goddamn people, dude. Giving them fucking pears. You wanted apples. <laughs> the other thing is the whole point of, of, of Groppler Zorn doing that is that he wants S- Star Trek. Star Trek. <laughs> he wants. <laughs> yeah. He wants Star Trek. <laughs> he wants uh, St- Starfleet to like create like an alliance with him. But why? What does he have to gain? He has a creature that makes anything he wants. And a planet that provides seemingly limitless energy also, which is a really big deal, honestly. Yeah, when the episode ended, I just went, why did he go through all this trouble? <laughs> what, is, what does he actually want with Starf? Like, uh, I feel like he could have made a pretty compelling case for, you know, alliance or usefulness to Starfleet and the Federation by just saying, hey, I got a planet that makes like all of this geothermal energy. That's um, it. That's all I'm you sure you guys could use it somehow. Like, how about you help me out here? And I'm sure that would have been a pretty good sell. Yeah. So is this, this is also the first time you've, have you seen data before Ricardo? Well, I, in that episode I watched, there was okay. two of them. <laughs> one for each of you. Um, yeah, I, I hadn't seen him. So I don't know. I still don't know what's going on. Even though I watched episode 12, I, I know like, he's like, he's kind of like a, he's like a robot, but like he has all all this races like memories collective memories in him <laughs> um and he like he's obsessed with like certain things like sneezing and shit like that 
I misread right. that as I, he has all this racist memory in him. That's what I thought you said. Okay. <laughs> oh, did I say that? Maybe, I, maybe I did say that. I don't okay. know. We, we'll have to rewind. That's fine. It. That's fine. He's got a lot of racist en- energy in him, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, he's got all these um, Check residual Brett Spiner's Twitter, re- residual, yeah. residual, like, like emotional and like he's got all this emotional baggage, right? Because he's taken on all these people's memories and stuff. Um, it's not clear. We, we, hopefully, they'll explain that later. Um, but he's cool enough. He's like a robot. He's got weird skin, and he's got weird eyes. Um, <laughs> well, I it, I find him weird as a as a concept because basically Riker goes, "You're like one of a kind android, right?" Basically, yes. And it's like, okay, so you're one of a kind. So we made you an officer on a starship. It's, hey, it's really man, odd. no special yeah. treatment <laughs> for just, the for the one hundred percent unique android life form that doesn't exist anywhere else yeah it's really odd it's basically the equivalent of like if we discovered like a new sentient species and then a few years later we're like well how about you join the military hey that's (laughs) that's exceedingly thoughtful of you know that society to not immediately dissect data for for (laughs) analysis and study well that that is a subject of an upcoming episode yes there is there is some debate that occurs I, I i like that character so far my, my favorite character is Riker's pretty cool he's like a badass but like for no good reason um <laughs> picard i like picard because he just like fuck you park this car dude and he's like yeah it's really hard though on me like, no, i don't give a shit dude <laughs> do it manually um and i dig uh jordy's cool he's got that cool visor and like he's like i'm in pain and, and they're, I'd they're actually like, forgotten that like he's supposedly in constant pain. Like, do they ever call that out again? Like, does that ever come up like as a plot no, point? I, I I don't think so. I think he's just constant. I think sometimes people use that to torture him. I think that's, oh. I think that's about it. Yeah. Mm, okay. But but you think he'd be like like the angry guy? Like I would. That's that's the acting choice I would have gone with. Like I'm always angry. I'm in pain. <laughs> hey Jordy, can you do this? No, fuck you, dude. <laughs> um, and and he he's kind of cool though. But he, like the the doctor's like, well, these are the options. Like we could do if you're in constant pain, we can do this or that. And he's like, nah, I'll just live with it. And he yeah, just walks yeah. away. That's yeah, very realistic, yeah. though. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. <laughs> I mean, I've I've gone to the doctor and they're like, well, you know, we could check this. And it's like, nah, I don't want to know. Fuck it. <laughs> like, well, we also dice. have this costly surgery. Nah, 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 nah. 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 How much is it? Yeah. I'll, nah. take my, nah. I'll take my nah. chances. Yeah, 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 yeah. I need to buy a new car. America. This is funny because it's like it. We're in the far future, and they still haven't figured out how to f- like cure blindness. Like he still has his eyes. Like they're still there. Yeah. So like the, and also not, you should probably be able to replace them with bionic eyes at this point if you want. Yeah. Yeah. Get Data's eyes, put them on him, <laughs> and put some like cameras on Data's eyes. That's it. Yeah. It's so it's so odd because like his visor it, it claims he can see all these different frequencies and like uh visual spectrums that uh regular eyes can't, which is fine. But why is it at the cost of immense pain? It's so weird. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and why can't you like come up with a a device that sees the same thing and projects it for you? Yeah. yeah as a yeah. human, like we're we're in the we're, we're kind of like, doing but that. But I don't want to rank too much on <laughs> on Jordy because I really do like Jordy. Jordy's great. Yeah, yeah. Jordy's um, great un- unless he's being a huge creeper, as we'll find. Uh, like. Yeah, that does happen. <laughs> My mm. one one of the complaints I have about the uh, it's about the uniform that <laughs> it's really cool. It's like it's like okay, it's futuristic kind of you know like it's a one piece bodysuit, cool. Mm. And then they're wearing dress shoes, and I'm like, what kind of? <laughs> you want to be comfortable. You don't. Yeah. Wanna, why would you all be wearing dress shoes? I mean, the uh, costume like goes that. through some changes as the show goes on. Yeah, uh, okay, actually, okay. starting with season two, it is noticeably different. They gain their collars, and uh, I believe it stops becoming a, a, a onesie. Yeah, it becomes a two-piece. There's one thing I really like about the first episode and his depiction of, of the outfits. It's that, like, later on, like you said, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the uniforms become way more standardized. Mm-hmm. But I like that there's, like, also, like, a skirt version. Or like a like a dress version, but they 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 go out of their way in that in initial establishing shot where where Picard is walking around the different parts of the ship, mm-hmm. and he goes into the warp core area, and you see a lady walk by in a dress, and you also see a man walk by in a dress, 
And I thought oh, that I was always real catch that at the time. Yeah, I always found that interesting whenever I watched this episode because to me it makes it seem like, hey, in the future, Just all clothing, yeah, all clothing is unisex, no yeah, matter what like, the clothing. That actually is. is a really cool point because, like, uh, I I remembered that Tasha Yar never wore a skirt, and so I Except saw this in this episode. Yeah, uh, and then I saw that like there was a you know the the skirt Starfleet officers that, that you mentioned. And I was like. Right, there were skirt versions of the uniform, and then I started to wonder, like, oh, then, it, like, is this an episode where all the ladies are wearing skirts, and not all of them were? Yeah, and then, like, it's interesting because, like, because uh, Deanna Troy wears uh, a dress, and then the very last shot of the show, Tasha Yar is wearing a dress. Deanna but... Troy's outfit does look like make her look like a go-go dancer, though, because <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like she looks like a Yandy dot com Halloween sexy starship <laughs> officer costume. <laughs> Like, quote, unquote, starship officer. Yeah. Uh, yeah only yeah, without yeah. the cleavage window. That's the only thing that's missing. Yeah. Um, I mean, her outfit actually gets worse. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, well, yeah, it's like it's less like Halloween trashy and just generally scantily clad for no reason. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this, yeah, yeah so but, but it's those like knee high shiny boots that really like it kinks up the outfit unnecessarily yeah yeah. you had mentioned uh the love thing with picard and beverly before yeah and and these these people also have like a weird love like they they were previously clearly they were like lovers yeah Riker and troy Mm -hmm. so they they're setting up a bunch of relationships really early on except with like Riker and troy like she reveals like she has a telepathic ability with Riker, but then never really mentions it it's really odd because like so so she's she's half betazoid right which is like a like a humanoid race in star trek which mm-hmm. means she's only half good at her job because the whole point of betazoids is that they can read people's minds mm-hmm. but then because she's half betazoid all she can do is read people's emotions which is why this entire episode if she was just a regular betazoid she could be like oh yeah there's just another alien down on the planet yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if they had a better employee. Yeah. They'd be like, essentially. They'd be like, nah, dude, th- this guy's bullshit, dude. This this place is a, there's an alien. They're torturing him. Yeah, it's why when when she comes into the meeting with Groppler Zorn, Groppler Zorn's like, oh, it's a beta zoy here, and he's very nervous. Yeah, and they're then, like, nah, don't worry, she's just half. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she can only generally sense emotions. It's fine. But I just I always thought it was funny that like beta zoids. As far as I know, I could be wrong. Star Trek fans, if I'm wrong, uh, let me know and I will whatever. But but you will just I, not accept I, it. <laughs> but as far as I know, Betazoids aren't like a rare species, right? So why not just hire a Betazoid <laughs> to be your counselor and just be like, all right, here's a she just can tell. I don't know. You know? Are, are all yeah. full Betazoids as horny as Deanna Troy's mom? Uh, I I I don't, I gotta imagine that that's kind of their bag because pretty much every betazoid you see on the show, I think this is, I think it's only the two, but still, they're all right, like, then all maybe, like maybe that's the problem. Like they, they're just <laughs> too busy boning it up. They're just, they're just like, it's like Vulcans always on a pawn far. They're yeah, always exactly. Why the fuck? <laughs> well, well, it's Way like, they sense, like oh, the, I could sense this person's horny. Oh, fuck. I'm going to, I'm going to hit them up. Yeah. <laughs> then, oh man, there's an episode. Oh, I can't wait till we get there where everyone's just horny. Oh, boy. or like, <laughs> nice, dude. it better be episode 69 or I'm going to be very upset. <laughs> um, so uh, another thing is uh, Tasha Yar is pretty badass. Like, like I like that. She's kind of like the lead security or like, yeah, she's a fun like, take on a security yeah, officer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She's, she's really cool. And then, um, so I, I don't know much about, like I said, the previous series before this, but Leonard McCoy, he's of course, he's from the last one, right? From the last mm-hmm. series. Mm-hmm. And he shows up just in this little cameo. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to yeah. talk about that. So like, it's weird. So you haven't, you haven't seen any of the original series, but you've seen the movies. I yeah. seen the movies, yeah, 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 yeah. Leonard McCoy does not have like a Kentucky Fried Chicken accent in in yeah. those movies, but yeah. for some reason, he learned when he got old, he turned into a colonel. It's really odd. No, he's, he's not a, just yeah. Admiral yeah. Marvin. <laughs> yeah, because it's not just his accent; <laughs> his entire vocabulary changes. It, look, okay, here's here's a here's the here's the scene where he's just talking with this weird Southern accent. If you got some reason you want my atoms scattered all over space, boy. No, sir. But at your age, sir, I thought you shouldn't have to put up with the time and trouble of a shuttlecraft. Hold it right there, boy. Sir, what about my age? So 
sorry, sir. If that subject troubles you. Troubles me? What's so damn troublesome about not having died? How old do you think I am anyway? 137 years, Admiral, according to Starfleet records. Explain how you remember that so exactly. I remember every fact I'm exposed to, sir. <laughs> I don't see no points on your ears, boy. But you sound like a Vulcan. No, sir. I'm an android. Hmm. Almost as bad. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> why, why is he suddenly calling people boy and stuff like that? It, it, he's like a racist fucking against, like, robots. Yeah. He's like, no, he's like, that's, yeah, he's that's like racist. Against, coming off here. Totally. Klingons yeah. and robots. He's racist um, against Vulcans and robots. It's I will so I will say this. I thought when I first saw him and I'm like, okay, this, it's, this is somebody, like, famous because they're in a lot of makeup. But then when <laughs> I heard him talking, I thought it was Jerry Reed from Smoking the Bandit. <laughs> <laughs> and i'm like oh jerry reed is in it that's pretty cool like, like he's got a weird cameo at the end of yeah, the first kind episode of a weird cameo in a futuristic show all right cool i'll, yeah. I'll run with it i i and will then, s- oh sorry sorry go go keep going, no, keep, no, going no, keep going keep no. going and then and then like you, i go to imdb him and i'm like what the fuck what <laughs> what, what did he have a southern accent in the original and then like i'm like well i don't want to dig i want to i want to save it for the pod but he didn't right like that's no, clearly no he did not Okay, okay. I mean, I I know there's a context in general where in the original show he is su- from the south, but he like hides his accent, like th- that's like a bit of his shtick. Oh, but he didn't like explicitly have that vocabulary. It's really odd. Like uh, he he embraced his roots when he became an admiral and I don't know. started it's wearing really- that amazing, like really comfortable looking admiral cardigan I know. well that's the thing so I, I this is one of the few things i researched before the podcast because i was so intrigued by this scene <laughs> uh, so so they did a screen test with him and he was just in regular uh McCoy, leonard mccoy uh-huh. um without the makeup in an admiral outfit and i think they were like okay first of all he doesn't look old enough he doesn't look 160 something right and then or 130 something whatever and then they were also like if he's that old, let's just put him in like old man civilian clothes. <laughs> so that's why it's that outfit because it's not. He's but it's not got even like in. the little shoulder paddy thingies. I think he just adds that to whatever outfit he's wearing or I something. I thought that was to denote his rank. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's it's it's. I think they just wanted to be like he's old. He just wants to be comfortable. This is what he. This is what he puts on the moment he wakes up. And leaves the house. I mean, I'll hand it to him that he does come off as old. Yeah. And it's so funny because it's like, it's this fun cameo, but he just shows up on the ship. First of all, why Data? Why would Data be the yeah, person I don't know. who goes pick him up of all these fucking people? Uh, and then also... Like why not Why not Beverly or anyone close to what he used to be or do? Yeah, like another doctor. Yeah, or, yeah exactly. Or, you know, why wouldn't Picard pick him up considering... Uh, you know, or Commander Riker, considering he's an admiral, you know, yeah. just, just have the weird android pick him up. Uh, but, but then, like, he comes on board, and then it's just a cameo. Nothing else happens. It's not even clear why he's, he showed up other than, here's a fun cameo. Which is fine. It's just funny, because, like, in the in the way they've re- re-edited the, this two-parter, he just shows up in the middle of the show, and then disappears. Yeah, it's weird, because, like, that's the sort of thing, like, a cameo or throwback like that is the sort of thing that you'd usually, like, conclude, like, a premiere with. Yeah. But, and and in a way, they do, because it's the end of the first episode, but it's a first episode of a two-parter, so, like, th- that, that yeah. pop is kind of weirdly spent midway through. Yeah. And... Yeah, I don't know. It actually would have been kind of nice if they put that at the end. Like, they re-edited it and just decided to put it at the end. It could literally yeah. just be cut out and stuck on at the end. It, it doesn't yeah, cause matter. Because it, it has no context otherwise. Yeah, absolutely none. <laughs> Although I did uh, uh, find out um, in cursory research that one nice thing about that cameo is that DeForest Kelly um, insisted on only being paid the, the absolute minimum amount that he could be paid for that cameo like out of respect to gene roddenberry oh wow that's cool i guess he just wanted to like come back i guess it's been it had been a while i suppose i guess it's true can i ask a question right here um so where who who did the show who rebooted it is it gene 
It was Gene Roddenberry. Yeah. Oh, okay. He's still alive here. So it was Gene Roddenberry along with Rick Berman, who worked as his producer for a few of his things, I think. This was back when Gene Roddenberry was pitching a lot of things. So I think he was pitching TNG, but I think he was also trying to get some other shows made, which eventually did get, get made. One was like Earth Final Conflict. And one was oh, the name escapes me, but like he he wanted to try other sci-fi concepts uh, outside of Star Trek. But obviously, the big easy sell is hey, Star Trek sequel. Right? Uh, well, yeah. also somewhere along the way, there was like a failed Star Trek two series or Star Trek Phase two. Um, oh, was there? I didn't even realize that. Yeah, like See, that's some, how how little I know about. Like that. somewhere in between, and this is more, like more more research for me. Yeah, like somewhere in between, like they were trying to put together a second series, and they actually got much of the first uh, show's cast back, but Leonard Nimoy didn't want to didn't want to come along. Um, oh, interesting. Or I forget if it was Nimoy, if it was Kirk. I think it was Nimoy. Um, yeah, spot like N- Nimoy is usually the one with like the higher like. Like he he like he refused to come back. Uh, yeah, and I, and I think I even yeah. found out that uh, parts, for generations yeah. parts of the of the set that were constructed for Star Trek Phase Two um, are what ended up kind of being repurposed for the Battle Bridge. Oh, that's that, why it looks so old school. That's why oh. it looks a lot like the first Star Trek's bridge. Gotcha. I always thought that was an interesting like the way it looked was really interesting like a detail because like you know by today's standards like the the, the TNG main bridge looks pretty like sparse and like you know old tv show ish but compared to that battle bridge like the battle bridge looks like the old show i always wondered if that was like a throwback or if they did it like as like a reference but that's really cool what do you think about wesley ricardo i, I thought like i thought like at first he was cool because i'd seen i could jump ahead but then like going back i'm like he just he just wants to get his mom laid that's basically <laughs> it. the most he's done is just trying to get his mom like that's really like his only so sin far you do you admire his efforts so far uh, yeah i mean fuck <laughs> it, dude. he's and then he's trying like to i don't know what he's trying to do like he, he was really like adamant about trying to get into, onto the bridge and then he like tried to show off he's like oh i know what these buttons do yeah. and uh and the picard invites him to s- okay here's the part that really annoys me picard hates children right yeah so he, he explicitly yeah, yeah. says so to his second in command but then he realizes Wesley. This is why I think your angle of like, oh, he's at secretly my son holds water because like he realizes, oh, that's 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 Crusher's son. He goes, hey, do you want to sit in the captain's chair? It's like, what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, th- and then he's like, he's like, get the fuck off. Like, like a minute later when he touches the buttons and then he's like, oh, someone there's a there's a homing thing, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, he's like, you know what? You know too much. Get the fuck out of here, dude. I think. Well, okay. In the ba- in the era of episodes, I remember, like I was last in before we began this podcast. I don't recall Wesley being as aggressively, like, unlikable um, as he was in the early first or second season. Like, yeah, I, I was midway through there, season yeah. three, and he'd already kind of like matured a little bit, stopped wearing the the tricolor sweater. You know, he, he was starting to like become like a, a person that could that you could talk to and use for dialogue and <laughs> stuff like that. I, I, you actually I, start writing his age yeah, for his age. Yeah. Yeah. His, actually it yeah. felt like Will Wheaton could play this character, but yeah, he's, he's uh, for, for right now, he's very benign and just kind of, eh, yeah, my mom, she's, yeah. she, my dad did. Yeah. And um, he wants, she wants, he wants to get his mom laid and yeah. it works to an yeah. extent. This is the scene randomly, so this so this scene where Picard meets up with with, with Beverly to be like, you want to stay or not? And, you know. So let me. First of all, let's. Here's the clip. Now your assignment here, I would consider and approve a transfer for you. Oh, do you consider me unqualified? Hardly. Your service record shows you're just the chief medical officer I want. Then you must object to me personally. I'm trying to be considerate of your feelings, Doctor. For you to work with a commanding officer who would continually remind you of a terrible personal tragedy. If I had had any objections to serving with you, I wouldn't have requested this assignment, Captain. You requested this posting? My feelings about my husband's death will have no effect on the way I serve you, this vessel, or this mission. Ah. Then, uh, welcome aboard, Doctor. Riker to Picard. We're ready to beam over, sir. I, uh, 
I hope we can be friends. Thank you. So basically, they both want to fuck each other. Uh, yeah, yeah. Because she, she, yeah. she requested. But the weird thing is the content. See, the, even the music cue you heard, it's like it's like the end of the episode. Yeah. If I remember correctly, this scene takes place right before the the squid thing starts attacking the planet, right? Or it's currently attacking the planet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Why is it placed there? It's like in the middle of this giant like crisis, Picard goes, by the way, uh, you guys hold on. Uh, I'm going to go down to the medical bay and talk to my old girlfriend. Look, look they had, they had a saying. lot of pipe to lay down, okay? <laughs> they had yeah, to lay yeah. out a lot of the arcs that they were going to explore over the course of the seasons. It's like, it's like they made a mistake and put this scene in the wrong spot. I mean, like, like <laughs> they, look how they introduced the holodeck. Yeah. <laughs> like, it, it's so, like, shoehorned in. It's like, where's Commander Data? He's in the oh, yeah. forest <laughs> simulation practicing how to whistle. I know. <laughs> Like how? Oh my God. We, why is an android bad at that? It's a purely mechanical action. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That entire thing is the the whole holodeck thing is them showing off, basically, right? Yeah. Basically, they're like, hey, look, we can do this crazy thing. Where, Wonderful spe oh, uh, special effects. Yeah, we can green screen Riker into the forest, and it's like, it's like a ten minute side story, like side a side thing plot. Wesley and falls in the river. Yeah, fucking Wesley falls in the river. And then there, that's it's just all to prove that the, the the holodeck is very real, right? Well, it's also so, a, a opportunity for Data to really lay out his whole deal at for, you know like the very first time, and yeah, you know he's identified yeah. he's identified very very bluntly as Pinocchio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like yeah. <laughs> it's actually I have that clip right here. When the captain suggested you, I looked up your record. Yes, sir. A wise procedure, sir. Always. Then your rank of lieutenant commander is honorary. No, sir. Starfleet class of 78, honors in probability mechanics and exobiology. But your file says that you're a machine. machine. Correct, sir. Does that trouble you? To be honest, yes. A little? Understood, <laughs> sir. Prejudice is very human. I appreciate that exchange. Now that does trouble me. Do you consider yourself superior to us? I am superior, sir, in many ways. <laughs> but I would gladly give it up to be human. Nice to meet you, Pinocchio joke for a brief huh. moment biker wanted Intriguing. to fuck data <laughs> you're going to be an interesting <laughs> companion mr data <laughs> yeah it's it's weird. okay so he gives him the not only is data... smile as he calls him pinocchio it's like yeah, you know, yeah. i know who you are <laughs> <laughs> yeah so both both picard i mean that uh, riker and data are racist yes and... <laughs> but I, I i do appreciate the candor involved it's like Riker's very, very honest and clear about his feelings. That That is a nice trait of Riker in the show in general, is that he's very, like, when he first has his one-on-one -on -one meeting with Picard, he basically tells Picard, you know what? I, I did what I did. Fuck off. You know? Yeah, off and I'll back. do it again. It's my first day. Yeah. <laughs> I'll fucking do it's it again. first day. Just try to get yeah. in danger. I'll stop you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So then the whole episode basically culminate so the point of the episode is that q is testing them right right and it all culminates in okay oh, yeah the test <laughs> <laughs> yeah even 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 the audience the, you, you literally forget until until q shows back yes. up because <laughs> yeah because because they're completely separate plots uh you know it turns out blah 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 there's a there's an alien stuck uh trapped underneath the surface of the planet uh the groppler zorn had captured him and blah 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 they need to free him and that's q's test right right and it's like it's the, and it's this great sequence where uh q is basically just like goading them it's like come on just kill him <laughs> you know the that, whole time. that makes it a little too <laughs> obvious man you, you're kind of like it's it's really odd because he's supposed to be this all no I, I guess it's sort of playing their hand a little bit like he's supposed to be this all-knowing guy but it shows that he's just very emotional yeah, and he's also you know, he, it's also clearly petty. It's a weird idea. I mean, it's it's actually pretty cool as a way to start the series, I think. Cuz it's like you would normally start the series with something that's probably a safer plot, you know? Like like if it's just a Groppler Zorn thing. Yeah. I think that would have made sense as a way to start the series, but then you also have Q who's it's a it's weird. It's like you're throwing in a metaphysical idea or a plot very early in the series. Like as the first idea. And I think it's an interesting way to start the series because it's not something you would probably expect 
Because usually, you know, Star Trek episodes tend to be more of like, here is the political or moral problem of the day, and here's how we're going to solve it, right? And it's it's very interesting that it starts off with, here's an existential crisis that you need to solve. Before. What I like about that setup, though, is that it kind of like presents a thesis statement about like TNG and uh, I guess Star Trek in general. Like the, the general yeah. outlook of Star Trek is that people can be better. There is an yeah. enlightened future ahead of us that, you know, it will have solved all of the major problems will have, you know, evolved beyond our prejudices, et cetera, et cetera. And this beginning, like very, very bluntly just puts like, it frames it as like, you guys are still, you guys are still assholes. This, this species sucks. And Picard's like, no, we don't. God damn you. Like we're better than that now. <laughs> it's the future. We're better than the people watching us. And I, <laughs> we're better than our audience. Yeah, it's like we're capable of being better than these idiot monkeys watching us and, you know, eating their <laughs> frozen TV dinners on their trays. And and they succeed, kind of. I mean, cur current events seem to complicate that a little bit, but, you know. <laughs> no, this is, this is hundreds of years in the future. Right, so. right. Still, yeah. though, still, though. I, I, so, <laughs> I have, I've said this before this year. I've said it a million times. No one will listen to me. I've said it so loudly, but I'll say it again here publicly in this public forum, <laughs> that humanity is a very unevolved species and aliens would have nothing to do with us. We're fucking stupid. <laughs> Why, like, yeah, if they want to come and steal our resources, yeah, they, they, they would do that. But yeah. we would never be exploring shit, dude. People would be exploring us, but yeah, I, that's, that's the, that's, that's the view I've always had of do, do you, have you, either of you guys, um, I, I'm sure you guys have watched soccer, right? By, um, Tarkovsky or have you heard of roadside picnic? Me? No, but go ahead. Yeah, okay. Okay, I'll explain. So basically, road, the, the premise of Roadside Picnic is that the people type of aliens who are into do intergalactic travel are so advanced that they would probably consider us ants, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like we're basically invisible to them, right? The same way ants are invisible to us when we're having a picnic. The premise of Roadside Picnic is that when, when they so quote unquote visited Earth, they left a bunch of shit behind that started transforming the landscape and stuff to do weird psychic shit. Mm -hmm. And it's actually their trash. It's the equivalent of us leaving like a, a, a bag of chips wrapper on the side of the road. And that's kind of how I think aliens would view probably our solar system. They would probably just be going by and going, Ugh, this one has a bunch of ants on it. And they just leave yeah. that one alone. Yeah. You know? Actually, they're like, oh, fuck, dude. This discussion <laughs> and is. And it's kind of rotten. It's kind of <laughs> rotten. Let's get the fuck out of here. Dude. This discussion is reminding me of this really great series of, uh, I think, Tumblr interactions I saw once where it was like, it was about Star Trek, actually. And it was about mm -hmm. like, the, it, it was like this theory that human, like the human race or the human species is kind of like the the federations like florida man and <laughs> in that like the only like humans are respected and admired for their ability to be completely stupid and insane like they they <laughs> act illogically they act unreasonably and that's the only reason why they like stumble upon progress and yeah, all yeah, of these yeah. other species and races that would be boring and do the efficient thing all the time uh, you know are kind of stuck in the rut that that creates for them and the only way things get shaken up and 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 like jumped ahead is when humans come in and fuck shit up because that's what we do, <laughs> which is a funny I way probably, to look at it. In that con, I, I I think I think it's a fair point. I think in that context, like Klingons would probably be more even the Florida man, just because they're like this weird warrior race that they hate science yet have somehow discovered warp travel. But and they're always trying to fight people, and they have this stupid code of ethics. There is always a bit of but, cognitive dissonance around their like use of technology, isn't there? It's like every the, time the I Klingons see them, Klingons literally don't make any sense. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you're right. But anyway, what, we'll, we'll get to Klingons. Klingons like, yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a wharf. Yeah. Oh, wharf is a Klingon. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Wharfs, wharfs are weird, as you could already. I love. Okay, this is there's this interaction. Uh, that Picard has with Worf in this episode that I think is really fun. You know, like when um, Q shows up again and Worf is about to shoot him with the laser, mm -hmm. uh, the laser, the phaser. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's that's the scene right here. Sorry, sir. You reacted fast, Mr. Worf, but futilely. <laughs> I will learn to do better, sir. Of course you will. <laughs> he, he 
He's like, Worf, you fucking idiot. You almost shot our fucking hull out with your fucking phaser. He <laughs> is so mean to Worf here. And, <laughs> and like, I know that we're painting this picture of, like, Picard being a particular hard ass in this episode, but he continues to shit on Worf. That's fine. This... You- Worf is kind of the the dumb idiot of the, kind of, of sort of cast. like he'll yeah. he's like the guy who like says like you know we, we need to fight immediately no don't do that every suggestion Worf makes yeah. like Picard shoots down like yeah like offhand and then he says what we're really gonna do yeah Worf is is the voice of of uh, overreaction in any in any situation like as the series goes on you'll see like Worf goes we have to stop them now and Picard's like calm the fuck down Worf Jesus Christ okay let's 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 talk like adults there's one thing we haven't mentioned yet is I really love this blu-ray restoration like it like back when I watched this on broadcast like like there's a lot of things they they improved like in the the intro song where those really high violin strings were playing I never even heard that on the broadcast version and I always <laughs> noticed that on this version I think either my TV was shitty or the broadcast was shitty. And I and I find it really enjoyable to hear this super high energy version of the song. No, oh, yeah. I've never and heard before. Like and you are absolutely right that the Blu-ray restorations that they pulled off like are like they are a technical marvel, man. They they it, it yeah. is such a impressive job that they did. I actually bought like the Blu-ray set at some point while watching it on Netflix because I realize I'm watching this so slowly that they will lose the 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 license <laughs> to stream these before I'm done. So next time it was on sale, I just bought them. But I watched a feature at like, you know, fairly recently on that's on the Blu-rays. It's like, here's here's all the painstaking bullshit that we went through. We went through literal thousands of archival boxes of film reels because we re- we we recut it like yeah. shot by shot from the original dailies, man. Like yeah, they basically overcut the entire series. <laughs> and like the the wor- then the most impressive parts are when they get to the special effects because not all of them are easy to recreate. They had to mm-hmm. uh, bring out the old ship models, recreate all the camera moves for the ship for the model, like um you know the miniatures and all that stuff. And in mm-hmm. parts where they couldn't like um find an old matte painting. They digitally recreated it like painstakingly. They like yeah, it's uh, so it, impressive. It's, how much it's work. so much work, and it's like it, it's it's so clear that the people who did it really really, really love loved, Star Trek, loved the show, and it's like it, it makes you feel good yeah. watching it. So there's, there's two things about the restoration that that made me like really kind of fall in love with it. One is when you watch the intro sequence, the last part right before the Enterprise is about to warp off. You see people walking in the windows. Yeah. And I thought that's so fucking cool. You would, you never noticed that in the original broadcasts. And now they went through that detail to make sure that's really well known. The other is that in this episode, the Enterprise fires phasers from below the ship, right? Towards the planet. Mm -hmm. In the original broadcast, the phasers, if like, you know, technical manuals and shit for, for the Enterprise and whatnot, it fired from the wrong spot. It actually fired from a spot where I think, uh, if I remember correctly, it's where like the captain's like, like own like personal cruiser is supposed to be stored. Mm-hmm. That's not where the phaser would shoot out of, and they actually fixed it in the Blu-ray. Okay. So like, yeah, so like they are changing things slightly, but they're doing it because it's technically more correct. <laughs> yeah, like the uh, one part in the featurette that I saw, like, kind of made a point. It's like um, their guiding light in the restoration project were like this uh, husband and wife, the Okudas, um, mm-hmm. who worked on the original show's VFX. And they were pretty much like the Rosetta Stone to all of the archives and stuff that they had. Oh, um, cool. Like they were able to interpret everything and kind of tell them what the intent of every special effects shot was. And like they were able to you know, uh, help them make sure that what they recreated was exactly as wasn't in, was intended. And in the in little cases like what you just mentioned, they, you know, made little tweaks where it made sense to. But for the most part, they just kept everything exactly as it was. Just That's better. super cool. Yeah. So anyway, uh, well, that was that casual was Blu-rays, everyone. <laughs> Yay. So that's the, that's the end of the uh, first uh, two part episode of Star Trek Encounter at Farpoint. Ricardo. What did you think? What would you rate this out of 10? What would you rate it? Uh, I would probably go. I didn't hate it. I didn't like love it. It wasn't like, oh, man, I, I, I wouldn't see it again. I wouldn't watch this again ever. 
this gotcha. episode. Um, so I would go with like a six. Gotcha. All right. What about you, Dan? Well, I do recall uh, that season one in my first go through was it's notoriously rough. Fans will tell you. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And so it was. But, you know, uh, amongst first season episodes, this is definitely one of the better ones. So I would maybe give it a seven. Yeah, I think I'm in a similar boat where I, I will probably give it an eight out of ten just because uh, I think it's like a really audacious way to start off your series with an idea that isn't very easily digestible by a mass audience. Like Q is a weird idea yeah. and to start off with Q for your series. It's very gutsy. That being said, uh, despite it being gutsy, it was also executed kind of poorly. So <laughs> um, with the two a plots conflicting with each other. So, eh, okay. Start not bad. They probably did the best they could because I think it turns out originally uh, Gene Roddenberry didn't want to do a, a two part opener. Hmm. He wanted to do a, a single one hour episode. So I'm imagining that probably is what Farpoint Station would have been, you know? Yeah. Uh, it it might have just started with Farpoint Station. Um, but who knows what really happened? And at the end of the day, you know, Gene Roddenberry wasn't always right anyway. Yeah. So we're too uh, casual to know so- what happened. <laughs> yeah. So that was the end of our first episode of Newbie Star Trek. Uh, if you guys want to catch more, you can go to newbiestartrek.com. That's N E W B I E, startrek.com. And then meanwhile, if uh, you guys just like us talking in general about other things like other movies and stuff, Ricardo, Dan, and I, you know, we, we have another podcast called uh, The Fugitive Frames film podcast yeah um, go just go to fugitiveframes.com we can you, we'll usually choose like um one film topic where it could be like you know psychological horror movies or it can be like a year and then we'll just or something like that whatever our guest feels like and we'll just pick some movies and talk about them so. look if you like what you heard here and you want us to talk more but about movies just listen to the other podcast as well yeah yeah fugitive frames film podcast we can triple continue f. hanging out yeah f f f f triple f podcast Sorry, i stepped all over your url <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. go to whatever he said uh, uh, yeah just just fugitive fugitive frames.com and then also uh if you want to hear us gab even more just but uh, over some video games sometimes we review video games too and just, random shit like that you can also we have a, a youtube channel called fugitive games haha see it rhymes uh so just head over to it's like poetry uh, uh, j- yeah it's like poetry uh just head over to uh fugitive dot games uh just type that into your search bar and then sh- it'll, it's an address it's crazy you can have dot games as a, as a url or just as in youtube just search for fugitive games and we'll come up so yeah. we're gonna go on the next episode we're gonna watch the naked now which is the uh the crazy sexy romp <laughs> episode of tng we're gonna go right into some risque stuff but in the meantime so this has been marvin with ricardo and dan thanks for joining us and we'll see you guys next time 